Hey guys, Tony here. So in this video, I want to get deep into the idea of maintenance, maintenance as a covered service and maintenance as a non-covered service. So uh, a bunch of you had a ton of questions and rightfully so, because there really just isn't a clear, concise black and white answer for this. It is absolutely a judgment call. That judgment falls first on you, the shoulders of the therapist, and then second on the reviewer. So I pulled some resources together to, to try and help us make educated decisions on what's a covered maintenance, what's a non-covered maintenance, and then help you develop a policy to guide those decisions. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Within the zero to paid Medicare billing course, we've covered this section. This is part of CMS chapter 15, the Medicare benefit policy manual. This is page 176. So maintenance programs, right? The establishment or the design of a maintenance program is covered if it requires the specialized skills of a therapist, the knowledge of a therapist, the judgment of a therapist. So these are important words that we want to take into consideration when we're documenting medical necessity for establishing a maintenance program. Uh, if skilled therapy services by a qualified therapist are needed to instruct the patient or appropriate caregiver regarding the maintenance program, such instruction is covered. So when you're documenting, when you're writing your report, whatever it is that you're doing, document why does it require the skills of a therapist. Um, if skilled therapy services are needed for periodic re-evaluations or reassessments of the maintenance program, such periodic re-evaluations, reassessments are covered. You have to determine what is periodic. And I can tell you from an exercise, you know, physiology background, um, if I've got a classic individual, maybe they've got Parkinson's or some other kind of degenerative condition, if I develop a strength program, right? what would periodic be? They're not going to display changes in muscle physiology and strength within two or three workouts. So to see them once a week isn't going to make sense. Maybe a periodic reassessment would be once in six weeks, probably closer to once in 12 weeks, because it's going to take 12 weeks to see and affect any kind of change from a strength perspective, a programming perspective, I'm not going to change their program for six weeks. They just need to do it. And so these are some of the, the ideas. You want to go out, find the research that says and supports, okay, based on clinical guidelines, it's going to take 12 weeks to affect enough change in the patient's condition that the patient would require a new program, something new to do, a new home exercise program or new gym program, whatever. That substantiates why I'm doing another maintenance visit covered by Medicare in six weeks, because it does require the skill of a therapist to update the program, to assess the progress and progress this particular plan, right? But it doesn't make sense that I would see this person once a week um, just to carry out the plan. Carrying out the plan is not a covered service. Assessing, updating, changing, that is a covered service. And then of course here, delivery of the maintenance program. So once a maintenance program is established, coverage of therapy to services to carry out the maintenance program turns on the beneficiary's need for skilled care. And this is where I would tell you to look at the variability of the condition. If it's a somewhat stable condition, if it's not changing, if the patient's not at risk, you're not gonna justify medical necessity to take them through their program. Even if you believe as a therapist, we need to do you know, these high level, highly complex um, activities, I, I would say it's beneficial. I would say it's helpful. But I go back to take two scenarios, step away from this for a second. If I teach a, an individual an exercise program, I give them five extra, three exercises, three exercises to do. Do this, do this, do this. This is how often you do it. This is how many times you do it. This is what you're going to do. And in six weeks, we're going to reassess your progress, right? Just go do it. Now take that same person. 
have them work with a personal trainer. Okay. Um, how much more improvement are they going to get? How much more benefit are they going to get? Yeah, it's more enjoyable. Maybe they're more compliant. Medicare isn't paying for either of those scenarios. If we can get the individual to do the programming the way we prescribe, whether they do it by themselves or they do it by working with a personal trainer or a therapist one-on-one, -on -one, I would say the improvement is probably going to be comparable, you know, and, and we also want to think like, what is the training history? Now, granted, I'm talking to you as an outpatient orthopedic therapist. I'm not talking neuro. I'm not talking any other um, kind of specialty, but from an outpatient perspective, uh, orthopedic perspective, I can tell you that most of my patients are not highly trained athletes. They're not highly trained individuals. They are novice exercisers at best. They don't require highly, highly complex, um, highly variable programming. They just need to get in and do this stuff. Even if they have a neurodegenerative condition, even if they have um, you know, medical complexities, if they're stable, if they're not at risk for an MI, if they're not at risk for a CVA during the workout, if they don't need to have their blood pressure monitored every minute of every session like you know some people do i'm hard pressed to say that it's medically necessary that i see them twice a week if they're not going to do the program now we've got a different situation now they need motivation now they need encouragement now they need to make it more exciting and entertaining none of those are covered services right so we need to look at this from the perspective of okay, what is really the barrier to this individual doing what needs to be done? If it's truly something that requires the skill of a therapist, we, we can talk covered service. If it's, if it's just motivation and, and you know, encouragement and excitement and um, transportation, equipment, none of that is covered. So let's take a look. You guys have seen these examples. If you haven't, read them. I'm not going to read them, but this one is the one that I always go back to that I think is most appropriate for this conversation. So example number three describes a scenario in which skilled services of a therapist would be necessary to actually carry out the maintenance program. Everything you typically see in the verbiage around maintenance therapy is establishing and updating, not carrying it out. This is where we get into carrying it out. So where there's an unhealed, unstable fracture that requires regular exercise to maintain function until the fracture heals, the skills of a therapist may be needed, not are needed, may be needed, to ensure that the fractured extremity is maintained in proper position alignment during range of motion exercises. In this case, since the skills of a therapist may be required to safely carry out the maintenance program, given the particular patient's uh, special medical complications, therapy would be covered. And this is where I said, you know, unstable, unhealed, it's a variability issue, like it's a risk issue. Now, this isn't a situation where we're saying the patient's at risk of falling if they don't have the direct supervision of a therapist. Um, you know, I, I would say this would be comparable to like people with a wound healing problem that need the skills of a therapist to assess the wound on a frequent basis, to address the wound, to, you know, do what needs to be done without compromising the tissue of the wound. That requires the skills of a therapist. But general exercise, um, you know, even if the patient has cognitive decline and, and problems with repeating movements and memorization, problems with confusion, I really can't say that that, in my opinion, um, makes maintenance medically necessary on a more frequent basis. But that's why I said this, this is left to the discretion of the therapist and potentially the discretion of the reviewer. And so a couple other resources I pulled together for you guys. So this is a link for skilled maintenance under Medicare. This is put out by the APTA. They talk briefly about GMO versus, I can never say that word, 
um, what you need to know. You know, there's a difference between medical necessity and maintenance. They don't mean the same thing. Medical necessity is always required, whether it's a maintenance program or a rehabilitative program. Uh, as of January 1st in the new year, which is right around the corner, PTAs are allowed to provide maintenance programs where they weren't allowed to do that before. So that's a little bit of increase in the freedom. Um, this was an interesting from the University of Virginia, guidelines for physical therapists treating clients with neuromuscular disorders. I, I tend to see neuro-focused um, diagnoses that go down the road of covered maintenance more than standard orthopedic. But basics of Medicare maintenance therapy, most of this stuff is coming right out of CMS chapter 15, where we just were, you know, maintenance or improvement is not expected and should not be the determining factor when we talk about coverage. Instead, it's all about does it require the skills of a therapist? Skilled maintenance therapy is covered when needed therapeutic interventions constitute a high level of complexity. Now, this is an interesting little section here. Skilled maintenance therapy is covered when the needed therapeutic interventions constitute a high level of complexity. That is not the same as us saying, what I'm doing is highly complex. It can only be done by a therapist. What this is saying, what CMS here is saying is that the condition is highly complex and requires us therapists to treat it. But a therapist certainly could take a standard, you know, highly stable uh, orthopedic diagnoses and say, well, I've learned all of this highly complex information. I'm going to deliver that. And because I'm a therapist and all the knowledge and all the wisdom in my brain is, is being utilized to, to do this highly complex intervention, it requires the skills of a therapist. No, it doesn't. Those are two different things. I cannot, like, it doesn't matter how much I know. It doesn't matter how much I bring, how much certifications and knowledge and history. It's does the condition, is the condition complex? Not is, is my treatment complex? I can make my treatment more complex for a simple condition. That does not mean it would be a covered service. How complex in, is the condition? How much assessment needs to be done? How dangerous is the condition? Could this individual fracture a bone doing something that needs to be done? These are the things, you know, do, do they need constant supervision, constant uh, assessment because of risk? And I would question, and, and this goes back to my bias. Okay, so if I see this person for an hour, what about the other 23 hours? You know, if, if I have to be so on guard um, and, and use my clinical skill to do something, what are they doing the rest of the time? What are they doing on the days that I'm not seeing them? How are they surviving when I'm not there? I think that's an important consideration when we try to determine um, if this really requires the skills of a therapist. So covered service maintenance does not pose any distinction in the Medicare fees. So reimbursement's exactly the same. Obviously, we already, we already said establishing a program, always covered to establish a program. The hiccup is in how much of the delivery of the program is actually covered. So transition from restorative, we would use the word rehabilitative, to maintenance. So a patient who's receiving restorative therapy uh, requires skilled maintenance therapy based on the skills and judgment of the therapist. All that stuff comes right out of the um, Medicare guidelines. Documentation. We need to document why the skills are necessary, why services cannot safely and effectively by, be carried out by somebody else, that there's potential for deterioration without the therapy, um, services themselves are reasonable. Remember, in the CMS guideline, they, they specifically say 
we have to consider the cost and the amount of therapy services we're providing relative to the amount of benefit the patient is receiving. You know, and, and this always reminds me of a story. An individual was receiving therapy um, through most of the year. They had a one month layoff in therapy. They had been maintaining during the, the therapy sessions. They had improved during the therapy sessions. They had a one month layoff. When they resumed therapy, they had significantly declined. Now, you can make two cases for that. On the one hand, you can say, look, look how effective therapy was. We were maintaining the current state. And when we stopped therapy, the patient declined. On the flip side, you can make the case to say, look how ineffective what we were doing really is. Because as soon as we quit, the patient declined. There is no long-term carryover or benefit. I don't know. I don't know what the, the answer is. Um, but I can tell you, you just need to be able to support your guess and your estimations. It needs to be reasonable within what the expected goals are going to be. Goals are being accomplished. If, if the goal is to maintain the patient's current condition, then the documentation should reflect the program's effectiveness in achieving this goal. So we want to see, are they maintaining? If the goal is to slow further deterioration of the patient's condition, documentation should reflect the natural progression of the patient's condition. I would use this exact terminology in your documentation. The goal of this maintenance program is to slow further deterioration of the neuro, you know, degenerative, um, blah, blah, blah. Documentation language examples, so assessment, during a covered maintenance, patient requires the skills of a therapist for safe stretching due to the presence of spasticity and hypertonicity, putting the patient at risk for muscle injury during stretch by unskilled caregivers and patient is unable to stretch self. The goal, patient to maintain current level of range of motion, uh, necessary for pos positioning to prevent pressure ulcers, patient maintain current ROM strength to prevent further deterioration. See, so this is my, this is what I'm saying. Take the words. Medicare is telling you we will pay if it's to prevent further deterioration. Just grab that, copy it, paste it into your longer narrative. Um, objective test, you know, and then these are some other resources to be familiar with. The original settlement between Jimmo. Um, this was kind of a handy document. Let me get back up here at the top. This is one of the CMS transmittal clarify nursing home, inpatient, outpatient coverage of maintenance. So I'll have all of these links below in the de description of this video. But guys, I just, Maintenance is tricky. There's other resources out there beyond this. I think one other resource that we always have to go to, CMS chapter 30. And this is regarding the advanced beneficiary notice. And the one that I always default to is under triggering events. So when we look at, you know, termination, uh, the example they give. So Mrs. X has been receiving covered outpatient therapy services uh, for speech. She's met her treatment goals and has been given speech exercises to do at home that do not require the therapist intervention. Mrs. X wants her speech therapist to continue to work with her, even though continued therapy is not medically reasonable or necessary. So Mrs. X is issued an AVN prior to her speech therapy um, resuming. It's no, when it's no longer considered medically reasonable or necessary. Um, you know, I mean, we don't know the details of this case. We don't know the history. We don't know why she's receiving speech language pathology services, but certainly there's ample examples of patients who don't require covered continued maintenance therapy. I just think we have to be really aware that we're not putting our biases out there to say, would the patient, and I'm going to grab full screen here, would the patient be better if they continued to work with us? Would we be able to slow down the decline 
if they continue to work with us? Yeah, I, I think undoubtedly, yes. The answer would be yes for most people. But I don't know that that's necessarily the covered service that Medicare was intending, you know, but I don't make the rules. I don't make the judgments. I'm just helping you find the resources to help you make the call. Now, special bonus section. Um, let me pull, I'm going to share my screen again with you guys. And let me share this example. So I shared this in my zero to paid course last night. And I just want to share it with you guys one more time. This is inside my YouTube channel. I want to show you just a quick video of an individual. And I'm going to show you how I address this situation. And I show you two videos. So don't worry about the sound. I don't expect you to be able to hear the sound. I'm going to mute it anyway. Sorry, I got to let this ad play real quick. It's how I pay my bills. I'm just kidding. Um, but this lady who you're going to see here in a minute, whoops, <laughs> this lady who you're going to see here in a minute, I've been working with her for about 18 months. It's been a combination of covered service, non-covered service, covered maintenance, non-covered maintenance. Certainly you can see. So her history, she had a bilateral hip replacement back in like 2006, I think in 2009. Then she had a revision on the right, complications associated with it. Then 91 days before this video, she had her right knee replaced. I mean, certainly there's huge deficits that you can see in the way she's moving, right? There is no doubt about that. Um, but just because you see the deficits and you immediately think, just like me, I can make that better. We can work on that. This will improve. That doesn't mean that therapy covered services is indefinite just because we see deficits. There's hundreds of millions of people in the world that have deficits that don't require therapy services. So in her situation, we did therapy. Then we transitioned to self-pay maintenance, self-pay personal training. Then we went back to therapy when she required um, new assessments of what she had been doing, but it wasn't just continued therapy the whole time. One other video that I think is worth watching just to kind of give you some perspective. Um, so this gentleman, very similar situation. Now it hasn't been as long, I, when you see this guy in just a sec, I've been working with this gentleman for four months now. He started as a physical therapy uh, covered service patient. He presented with left hip pain and low back pain. He, um, we're talking about getting on the ground. Oh, wait. No, no, we're talking about sit to stand. Uh, actually, uh, darn. Hang on a sec, guys. I want to see if I can show you the video that I intended. I guess I don't have it on here. Okay, no big deal. Let's take a look at this real quick. Um, so I did some groundwork with him during this same session. You know, he had fallen recently at the post office. And um, so how did I handle that? He did physical therapy. He got discharged from covered service after about three sessions. Then he joined our wellness program. He self pays per month. He did some personal training because he understood the exercises he needed to do. He just needed a place to do them and someone he enjoyed working with. That was me. So then he fell at the post office. We did a covered visit. We did an evaluation. There was no red flags, no major complications. I provided him with a program. All of that was done in a single session. Now he's back to self-pay, non-covered maintenance. And the idea is, again, he's mowing his grass using a riding lawnmower. He was cleaning the gutters like three weeks ago. Um, he drives himself, bathes himself, grooms himself, manages finance, does everything. He was setting up his Christmas tree. He was working on the furnace. Like The guy does everything he needs to do. He, and, and there's no medical complexity. So he's not at risk for anything, um, anything major. So, you know, in my estimation, he does not need 
three coverage sessions a week. He just needs to come in and exercise. And then in six weeks, we'll do an update to his program. The update will be covered, but the interim sessions are self-pay. This is our little lady that you just saw, same day, same session. That's a 20 pound kettlebell. She's doing sit to stands with a 20 pound kettlebell. Now she's gonna do, I, I think it's like a 12 foot, you know, suitcase carry. No assistive device, she's got the wall next to her. She's doing great. Again, we've got to find the justification like she needs the, the covered service to create the program. She needs the cover service to make sure she understands what to do. Beyond that, she does not need covered services. And she and her husband, they're 84 and 86 respectively. They, work, they were, before COVID, working out down at LA Fitness. She calls it La Fitness. Uh, five days a week. She was doing the treadmill and the exercise machines and all the stuff that she would do down there. And she would come to my clinic two days a week on a self-pay basis for personal training. You know, so um, those are examples. I'm probably extreme at one end of the spectrum that I believe that less and less and less is medically necessary and should be covered. Whereas there's other clinicians that believe everything is medically necessary and should be covered. Um, shoot, I keep dragging you guys along. I've got one more resource for you guys. Let's take a look at this LCD. I've, I'm, again, I'm sure you have seen this if you've spent any time with me, but it is worth repeating. So I'll do a quick search, total knee. This is the example right here. Um, we've all been here, but you know, so for example, as part of the initial exercise program for a total knee replacement, patient may start on an exercise bike, general range of motion activity. Initially, the patient requires skilled progression in the program from pedal rocks to a full revolution, perhaps assessing and varying the seat height and resistance along the way. The patient is, once the patient is able to safely exercise on the bike, no longer requiring frequent assessment and progression, even if setup is required, the bike now becomes an independent program and is no longer covered by Medicare. While the qualified professional may still require the patient to warm up on the bike prior to therapeutic interventions, it's considered non-skilled and unbillable. So we see these examples. We see this situation. Now the question becomes, and, and this is where I think it gets really interesting. Okay, so if I have a, a post-op total knee replacement case and the individual just needs to ride the bike, wants to ride the bike, enjoys riding the bike, they can buy a membership to my clinic. I don't have to let them ride the bike for free. They can buy a membership to my clinic just like other non-therapy patients do and have access to the equipment so they can ride the bike. They cannot buy a membership to my clinic and they can walk around the block. They can walk down the street. They can do, you know, air squats in the lobby, whatever they're going to do to warm up. They can do that. My question is for you, and, and this is a little bit of an ethical question, so if I'm not going to be paid for them to warm up on the bike anymore, because the bike is considered not skilled anymore, would it be appropriate? I say no, but my question is, would it be appropriate for me? What if I do the bike for three sessions and then I switch to the elliptical for three sessions and then I switch to the treadmill for three sessions and then I switch to, you get the point. Like each, each time I switch, now they do again, require the skills of a therapist to get them set up, to make sure it's appropriate, to make sure it's safe and fit it properly and learn how to do it. I don't know. I mean, I guess you can make a case to say, well, if the patient's gonna go to a YMCA, they need to know how to use different equipment. You can make the case to say, well, if the patient, we wanna improve you know, the patient's um, performance, we wanna vary the stimulus, right? You can make a case. The question is, should we make the case? Or should we just say, you know what? You enjoy this. Let's keep doing this. 
uh, it's a hundred dollars a month for access to the equipment. It's a membership to our, our clinic. You're welcome to do it. Use the bike before we start treatment. The treatment is only going to be the covered services. This line, I think, gives us a sneak peek of what would be covered and what would not. And we can extrapolate out beyond that, you know? So we can make things complicated if we so choose, or we can keep things simple and not get paid by the payer, but allow the patient to pay. That's ultimately what it comes down to. So guys, let me know what you think. And then in terms of the documentation, for transitioning from rehabilitative to maintenance to basically what I do upon what would kind of be discharge. I have my conversation. Let's, let's take the scenario. I create a 12 visit plan of care. Okay. Um, by visit nine, I have the conversation, Mrs. Jones, you know, what would you like to do? And I'm thinking in my head already is Mrs. Jones an appropriate patient to stay on for maintenance, both covered and non covered. What are the options? Where are we going? What's going to be the discharge plan? If we determine that, yes, Mrs. Jones has carved out three hours a week uh, to come here and work out and improve her physical health, she's going to continue on the hybrid maintenance and, and covered and non-covered maintenance program. Awesome. We have that conversation. We establish the, the plan for transition. And on the 12th session or before, the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, um, I write my progress report. Knowing you guys know you have to do a progress report by 10 sessions or earlier. So let's say on session 9 or 10, I write my progress report. Patient planning on transitioning to hybrid um, maintenance program, which includes covered and non-covered services times, you know, six months. I, I plan on them being with me for six months. During the six month time period, they're going to receive one covered maintenance session per six weeks to assess progress, assess uh, progress toward goals, assess response to existing program and update the maintenance program. So I do one, I tend to do one session every six weeks. Um, and, and then we go from there. Let's say we go through the 90 day certification period. We establish six months. I do a new progress report, even though it hasn't been 10 visits. I'm at the end of my certification. I do a new progress report. I request another 90 days. I do another covered session in six weeks and three times a week of non covered maintenance. That's essentially the way I write my plan of care. I send it over to the doc. The doc signs off on it and I, I re-up it every 90 days. If I go past 90 days and I haven't needed to do a reassessment, then when I do the reassessment, that now becomes a progress report. That now becomes and starts the new certification period. And so I just make sure that that session is covered within the new certification. The old one expired, the new one's beginning. There's no need for a new evaluation or a reeval if no significant unanticipated changes have happened. All right, guys, I hope that was helpful. I hope this answers some of your questions. And at the end of the day, you are the therapist. You are the one that makes these judgment calls. So support your decisions based on published guidelines, and you're not going to have a problem. Thanks so much, guys. I'll catch you on the next tutorial.